All right, so I kind of gave away a bit of the punchline of the talk, which is you know, wearable technology uh, in the sort of the uh, IoT sphere as uh, you know, my view and our view at NIMI is, is that a unique opportunity is around identity or more specifically authentication. Uh, and you know, when we talk about authentication, you know, there's a lot of talk about signals and aggregation of signals uh, you know, in a sort of multi-factor context. Um, and uh, but and in, specifically in IoT, uh, you you know you have opportunity for lots of different contexts and signals. Uh, but I'm actually going to flip it around a bit and say there's actually an opportunity for very strong high trust signals um, that offer persistence and um, and it, it's it's uh, there's opportunity to do actually less of uh, sort of big data and more sort of high trust high security high privacy um, sort of information gathering for identity authentication so since I'm first in this track, I get an opportunity. I'm going to talk a little bit more just about giving some context around Internet of Things. So what kind of, kinds of things are we talking about? Um, so uh, everybody there gives a slightly different definition of what the things are in the Internet of Things, but I'll give you my definition here. So four basic features. So one is, we're, I mean, we're talking about hardware, of course. We're talking about physical things. Um, and uh, it should have some processing capability. Communication. Now we talk about internet. It doesn't have to be on the internet. It can be on a, on a private network, but something that has communication capability. Uh, oh, jumping ahead here. Uh, inputs. Uh, so sensors can collect information. And I should say, in some cases, some of these things are more emphasized or de-emphasized. Doesn't necessarily have to have all of these things. Um, and outputs. And outputs uh, can be physical actuators actually doing something or uh, user interface, you know, visual, visual outputs. Um, and, but the, uh, well, we keep jumping to two points here. So, but really what it actually comes down to is I've described a computer, right? I mean, that's all I've done here. You've got processing, communication, inputs, outputs. It's a computer. Uh, but the reason why we talk about Internet of Things is because we're talking about a lot of things that don't necessarily have direct human interaction, although they might. And we're going to go full circle around with the wearable technology on this. Um, so we're talking, what are we talking about here? So, wow, this is going to get annoying if it keeps jumping to. Um, so some examples, so infrastructure monitoring like smart grid, you know, you can collect uh, information about electricity usage remotely. Uh, we've got uh, vehicles talking to each other. We have home automation, you know, you've got your thermostat and your security system. Um, and we have quantified self, which is where wearable tech often comes in, which is collecting information off the human body or using the body as, as a direct means of interaction with a human. So where does wearable tech fit in to this bigger, uh, bigger uh, sort of scheme of IoT? So actually, I might switch up to the computer so I don't uh, keep going two at a time here. Um, so IoT, wearable tech simply take the framework of IoT before, put it on the body. I mean, that's a very simple, straightforward definition. Um, so what are the basic uses of putting IoT, a, a thing that's connected on the body? So basic uses are quantified self, collecting information on the human body. And this is really where it started, which is learn everything about what's going on with the human body. Um, where this went to next is actually behavior modification, which means you know walk more, eat less, uh, concentrate more, uh, use the information collected, feed it back, and then actually change your behavior. Um, this one's a simple one, but it's actually a big one for me. Notification, send information to the user in a very discreet way, uh, which is to me actually one of the biggest killer applications of smartwatches. Um, human computer interaction, so a way, so this is where it goes full circle in IoT. We're actually going back to talking about things interacting with humans. Um, and so there's a variety of devices out there put on the body. There's a way for you to interact with uh, computers. Um, and then general purpose computing, which again, we're going full circle of back. I mean, what's, what's a smartwatch? It's actually becoming a general purpose computing device just with a smaller screen. Um, but 
so to put a framing around this, uh, I think wearable technology in the IoT context offers a pretty unique uh, opportunity. And so I'm going to take a second to decompose this. So I think the unique opportunity is the asynchronicity between signals captured, the insight from those signals, and the action that can be taken as a result of those signals. So uh, I, I heard a really good analogy at a wearable tech conference uh, in the context of uh, you know physical monitoring devices, which is you know in the old days you go to the doctor they only get information from you when you're at the doctor. They don't have information about you when you're out and about during your day. And so you go in, they say you have high blood pressure. Well, it turns out you only have high blood pressure when you go to the doctor. So it's, it's not an accurate reflection of your day to day. And the equivalent is, imagine uh, airlines, uh, f you know, airplanes, where there were no sensors in flight, where the mechanics only had data when the, when the airplane is in the hangar. It's actually not very useful. You want information throughout the day. So signals can be captured all the time because you put the sensors out there when, they're, when, uh, when the signals are being generated all the time. If it's on the body, it's persistent throughout the day. Uh, insight is, well, what do those signals mean? What, and then action is, well, what are we going to do with it? And traditionally, these things often have to be put together. Um, and you know, I'm going to start to make the connection with things like authentication, which is traditionally if you want to pull a signal from a human insight that this is the right person, authenticate them and then take an action, they all had to happen together at the same time. But with things like wearable technology, you can actually make those happen not at the same time, which gives new opportunities for more secure, more privacy protective and, and more compelling user experiences. So I'm going to come back to this. So let's put aside IoT and wearable tech, so there's some framing there. I'm going to jump now to the authentication problem generally. So if you forget about we're at an IoT track here and just think about authentication. So why do we do authentication? So I like to frame this. This is the first mile of trust to bootstrap an interaction. And there's two kinds of authentication, right? You can have machine to machine or human to machine. Both are actually major problems still are, are sort of problems we deal with every day. But the two, human to machine and, and machine to machine, have slightly different uh, issues with them. And we're gonna, I'm going to focus on human to machine. And you know, we heard about, we've hearing about this all the time, which is an optimization between trust and convenience, right? Um, so all the technologies we deal with with authentication today seem to always be about you know, putting a line in the sand as to where we're going to make that, uh, make that balance. Um, so I want to go through a thought exercise and say, let's actually go through designing an authenticator that uh, sort of gets rid of all the baggage of all the things we've had to deal with in the past of authentication. So if we want to optimize trust and convenience, let's look at them separately first. So if we were to maximize trust only, there's a really simple way to do this, which is to lock a person in a room during enrollment and never let them out, right? Because authentication is the problem of proving you're the same person that showed up before when you originally enrolled. So you enroll, let's not let you ever get out of the room. That's the maximum trust we can, we can uh, offer. So let's use that as our baseline. That's the trust, we would, the equivalent trust we want to achieve. So on the convenience side, the maxim, to maximize convenience, we can, do, we can make the user do nothing, right? That's maximum convenience. The user has to do absolutely nothing. Uh, of course, then anybody can get in if, if you know, we do nothing to enforce uh, authentication. Um, so, the, so you can see, obviously, this is where the balance comes from. These are, how do we balance these two things? So if we start with this as a framework, what, what is the perfect human to machine authenticator? Um, and so the reason why I'm going through this exercise is to show you that there's a lot of baggage we can sort of get rid of and look at some of the opportunities that IoT and wearable tech offer. So let's design an authenticator from scratch. So what is the, what is the perfect authenticator? So user has to do nothing, right? That was the convenience part. User does nothing and can get access to whatever they want to get access. On the trust side, um, this is where it makes sense to start throwing in biometrics, 
right? So perfect biometric that is universally unique, accurate, and can't be spoofed, right? That would be the ideal way to provide trust. Uh, you want something that's tied to the person, right? If it's something they know, it can be copied. Um, if it's uh, something they're carrying, it can be stolen. So something that's tied to the human, that was sort of the point of introducing biometrics. So if this is sort of the picture of the perfect authenticator, let's start to actually make it happen and see, see what happens if we're trying to uh, implement this. So first of all, on the biometric side, so perfect biometric, so what's out there? So we have DNA is probably the best biometric we have. Next down is probably iris, it's highly accurate. Uh, but it's not perfect, right? So we all know this, uh, biometrics are not perfect. They all have problems associated with them. They're not 100% accurate, not 100% universal. Um, and so, uh, so you know, right off the bat, we're going to have to make some compromises uh, and, and balance them off. Um, but before we figure out you know, what makes sense uh, in terms of how to actually establish a trust, um, I think there's a few points to make and you're gonna to start to see the connection with wearable tech and IoT, which is whatever the biometric is, matching should be as close to the body as possible, right? So one of the qualities uh, that we set up there, the perfect biometric, is can't be spoofed, right? Well, if you're collecting signals from the body and you're doing matching very far away from the body, there's a lot of opportunity to spoof that. You want to know that the signal generated from the body is very closely tied to the body. Um, and so, so this immediately starts to bring in the question of, well, hold on. If you're talking about things that are all very closely tied to the body, and this is an IoT track, we're talking, there's going to be lots of signals and contexts we could take advantage of. So what about multi-factor authentication, aggregation of signals. So you know, I think there's something that's worthwhile acknowledging here. The, why, the reason why we have multi-factor authentication at all is because the individual forms of authentication are not perfect. So there's nothing inherent that says multi-factor authentication is the answer to everything. It is, it is a, a design approach to compensate for the fact that biometrics or other factors are not perfect. Um, and uh, you know we can talk about aggregating a lot of signals, but as soon as we start to you know violate this concept of something that's very close to the human to the body, we start to encounter this risk of spoofing and gaming the system in some way. So and then there's another point of this, which is that local signal matching also favors privacy, right? Because if you're starting to create profiles of people based on both their biometrics but also other information that could be gathered through a variety of contexts. Um, if, if you're using things, like let's say you're using GPS, right, which is something that's not very tied to a person because it, it has to, GPS has to be captured uh, through a device uh, that uh, you know, doesn't necessarily have high trust associated with the user or using other behavioral contexts. Um, you're now having to create profile information about this person, and the matching is, is, is not likely going to be happening right there on the person. It's going to be happening in the cloud where the profile information is collected. And now you start to have privacy issues. You now have a profile or a template of a person that is not local and tied to the person. So, so I think it's worthwhile pointing out that uh, while we think about uh, opportunities uh, in collecting lots of signals, Let's, let's not lose sight of the things that matter for high trust, which is you want to minimize the risk of spoofing, you want something that's close to the body, which will also minimize privacy risks. So I've mapped out some of the concepts that would uh, create sort of a perfect authenticator. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, uh, a little bit about uh, the product that we make and so you can understand what was sort of the um, motivation there. And so, we make what's called the NIMI band, which is a wearable authenticator. Um, so the unique biometric that we use is what we call a hard ID. We actually use the electrocardiogram of the human body as a biometric. It's very closely tied to the body, hard to spoof. Is it a perfect biometric? No, it, it, uh, every, like every biometric, you have to manage false positives, false negatives. Um, but it's something we can put in a wearable form factor and do matching essentially right on the body. Uh, so the likelihood of spoofing is very low. 
Um, and I'm not going to go through all of the features of this, but essentially a summarization of what it is, it's, it's a wearable authenticator, knows who you are using the biometric, and then communicates identity credentials over Bluetooth low energy. It has a secure element in it, so it's, it's, uh, it can be treated as a trusted device. Um, and uh, you know, one way of thinking about it is it is that first mile of trust between the human and a machine. And then that, then from there, it becomes machine to meet machine interactions. So let's, but let's take the general concept of a wearable authenticator versus the perfect authenticator we outlined before to understand where we are and how far we have to go. So trust. So biomet you could, we can have local biometric matching. This is a very similar model to uh, the way Touch ID works on, on an iPhone, which is a biometric is kept local um, in a trusted uh, computing environment um, with a secure element. And so the, the, uh, the opportunity there is something that signal itself becomes a very sing singular high trust signal. But biometric is not perfectly accurate. So actually, we get to we add a secure token. We actually add a second factor. Turns out we get one for free because you're actually wearing it. So this is a pretty cool thing about actually putting authentication on the body, which is that with a device that you're carrying that has a secure element in it, you're carrying, you're carrying a token. Then you put biometric authentication on top of that, you actually have two factors in one. And so through, you know, you can call it magic or, or uh, design, you actually can get two-factor authentication in a single device. So let's look at the convenience side. So the reality is the user has to wear it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to loop back to this uh, a little bit later, which is, you know, how do we actually design authenticators that people want to use? Um, but the, uh, you know, where this is actually going at the end of the day is that people are wearing things anyway. Right, so you want to make this as low friction as possible. Uh, the future of this is that authentication really needs to be built into all the smart devices that we're wearing, close to the body, local authentication, and uh, but low friction because you're going to be wearing these devices anyway. But here's the really interesting benefit of doing all of this. Uh, I talked before about the asynchronicity between the signals inside and action. So the benefit of having authentication on the body is actually persistence. So the, the friction associated with having to wear something, having to go through an action to put something on your body is offset by the fact that we can actually persist the authentication. And you put it on, it knows who you are, and then that persists as long as you're wearing it. And then the rest is this machine-to-machine -machine interaction. Your credentials can be provided to whatever you uh, provide permission. Um, you know, whether you're unlocking physical spaces or you're unlocking your computer, well, the one putting it on once, and you can, you're essentially good to go for the day. So we, talk, we call this time-shifting authentication. We have a new dimension of time uh, because of the persistence of having the thing on your body. So we can actually offset some of the initial inconvenience through this concept of, uh, of uh, persistence on the body. So hopefully I've mapped out uh, sort of you know, comparing the concept of the, the perfect authenticator to how far along wearable authentication can take us. And um, you know, I think we're, we're getting a lot closer to something that makes a lot of sense in terms of being high trust, privacy protective, and low friction for the user. So what are the implications on the enterprise? So first of all, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of multi-factor in one. So convenient, simpler to manage, you know, there's, uh, when you're adding multiple factors, uh, you know, if you're doing things local to the user, you have multiple channels to manage, or you're, or you're taking a big data approach, you have lots of signals, you have machine learning, putting something on the body, you can have multi-factor in one a lot easier to manage. Consolidation of physical and logical access. You now have something physical you're putting on the body, you can actually do physical access as well. Um, this is actually a huge one, and we're seeing a lot of push in the enterprise to start consolidating physical and logical access. 
And what I mentioned before is this certain, well, I'll call near continuous authentication. I avoid the use of continuous authentication to be sort of a scientific purist. Nothing is truly continuous, everything is discrete. Uh, but it's pretty close to continuous. Um, and uh, persistent adds this dimension of time. You know, and a, a quick sort of anecdote, which is that he was talking to a customer and they said, yeah, we have continuous authentication. Uh, talking about certificates being deployed, and they can be continuously, uh, continuously uh, referenced. And I mean, having a, you know, providing a certificate that has a certain time of life is not the same as actually providing trust uh, back to the source, the human body. So, but here's I think the most interesting thing, which is authentication no longer has to happen just at the initiation of a session or uh, an interaction. Um, what we're hearing from our enterprise customers is the biggest, uh, the biggest value of all of this is it completely changes sort of the paradigm of transactional authentication to session authentication. The idea that you can, uh, for example, take a, take a secure SSH session, you know, going to your AWS uh, instance, um, you, know, you now can authenticate that for every single command that goes over the line, not just when you initiate the session. So if you have a session that's lasting days or weeks, you no longer have to worry about what's actually going on in that session because if it's dormant for a day and then comes back alive, you can actually, next command that goes over, you can go back and authenticate that command to back to the user. Physical user has to be there. So just to wrap up, so the question, is the world ready for something like this? And you know, I, the challenge is to sort of remove all the baggage of, of things that we think about in authentication and think about the opportunities that wearable tech offers. So technology. Yes, so technology is there. So we, you know, we started shipping this in December. Uh, all, the, all the pieces are there uh, technologically to make this a possibility. There's, there's no missing gaps on the technology. Infrastructure, mostly there. So you do need uh, transceiver endpoints. This uses Bluetooth low energy. We also use NFC. Um, there's, there needs to be some infrastructure work on the endpoints as well as obviously sort of deep connections. Things like FIDO certainly help a lot in terms of uh, making that a secure chain of trust. Um, and the last one is users. And we get this all the time. Are users willing to wear something like this? And quite frankly, the answer is what I said before, which is this kind of technology has to be just uh, present in a variety of things that people are wearing. And, and uh, having it uh, something that uh, a company imposes on users are the types of things that are not, uh, not really acceptable anymore. So you need to make it something that users are going to be willing to wear. So a couple of final thoughts. So um, multi-factor authentication, obviously, we all, I think, drink the Kool-Aid that says, you know, there is no single silver bullet and this is the way we have to go. But my perspective is don't expect a lot of weak signals will boost trust significantly, that we're going to get a ton of data, behavioral data, and then suddenly that will enable high trust. Um, what I... My, my position on this is that IoT is an opportunity to generate high trust signals with persistence. Uh, I think this is the real opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, we should really amplify the factors that uh, are going to be able to uh, establish that high level of trust. Um, local close to the user matching addresses both uh, security and privacy. So I would warn against uh, trying to create massive profiles in the cloud of users. Um, and it's, uh, you know, that's a sure great way to violate privacy. And last point, which is, in today's world, the user is king. Uh, you have to give them something that they want. Wearable tech is actually an opportunity because there's huge adoption right now. Wearable tech is still very early, but uh, the uh, you know people are wearing smart more and more smart devices all the time. This is an opportunity to get high trust authentication onto the body, provide that persistence, provide that convenience. Uh, so I do think that the world is ready now at this point, and uh, you know our customers are saying you have to give me something that users want to use. It can't be a next generation RSA token. So I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Not 
So uh, the way the system is designed right now is during an enrollment process, uh, your, your biometric is cryptographically tied to the secure element on the device. Now you can wipe that and give that to another person, but it's not a multi-user device. So it's absolutely possible you wipe it, it becomes a fresh uh, device, you start from scratch. So keys, the keys that are generated that provisions it with the applications that the user ultimately uses are, are created on the fly during provisioning. So when you, uh, when you uh, wipe the device, it's essentially, it's clean. There's, there's, uh, the user doesn't get tied to that device forever. It's based on keys that are established. Yeah. How fast can you wipe it? Um, takes about 30 seconds.